all know. Welcome everybody to our first school committee candidate debate for Lowell. Um, this is the at-large candidates and District 1 in Pawtucketville. This is co-sponsored by the Lowell Sun, LTC, Telemedia, <coughs> and Lowell Votes and Kamai Post. So thank you all so much for being here. And to our questioners, we have George Prokop and Vladimir Saldana. We have 15 minutes per question, five questions. Every candidate will have two minutes and one minute to respond if necessary to another candidate's um, comments. So thank you so much and we'll just get to it. So um, I'll be having everyone introduce themselves um, and then uh, <coughs> corresponding questioners will be able to ask a question of each candidate. So we'll start with Jackie Doherty and let's see you have um, opening statements. Uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll let you start. Hi, my name is Jackie Doherty. I'm running for re-election to the Lowell School Committee. I am one of the at-large candidates and I respectfully ask for one of the two votes uh, for the Lowell School Committee. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been involved in uh, the Lowell Public Schools for, I'd say, about 20 years now. Uh, first as an involved parent and then as a leader on the Citywide Parent Council for five years and for 14 years as a member of your school committee. Um, I'm also a college teacher. I taught at UMass Lowell and Daniel Webster College for about 11 years. Also spent more than 10 years as a volunteer in uh, elementary classrooms, leading writing workshops in during the day and in after school programs. So I think my background in education has given me uh, some real insight into the challenges our staff face and the frustrations our families feel uh, oftentimes. These times have been just so difficult because of the pandemic and what it's meant in terms of uh, learning for our students. And it, it is just in the times like this that we need someone with my experience and passion for doing this work. I look at every situation from the lens of a parent. What would I want if that were my child, my son or daughter in the schools? I pride myself on being uh, an active and responsive listener to community concerns, whether you're emailing me, texting me, or calling me on the phone, whether you're a parent, a staff member, uh, or a, a student Thank in you, schools, Jackie. I will listen and do my best to respond. Thank you. I do my homework. Oh, awesome. sorry, I'm out of time. Yep. I Thank you Jackie so much. Darling, <laughs> I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Mike Dillon, go ahead. You Hi, my name is Mike Dillon. I'm running for re-election to uh, school committee as an at-large candidate. Um, I just finished or I'm in the midst of my first term right now. Uh, I'm a firefighter in Lowell. Uh, I live in the Highlands with my wife and my three daughters. The oldest uh, attends Lowell Public Schools. And I think since I started campaigning two years ago, I've uh, talked about being a different kind of candidate. Um, and I think I've proven that uh, in, in my first term. And I'm not gonna speak like your typical politician. Uh, I'm gonna say what I mean. And uh, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna bow down to outside pressures when I'm making decisions. Um, and I actually, I think I thrive in, in pressure situations and making big decisions. And uh, we need we need tough leaders around here that are going to be able to um, to, to think on their own and, and make their own choices. Uh, a couple of things that I'm interested in doing. Sorry, I don't know about my time here. Uh, a couple more seconds. Number one is uh, physical fitness and mental health of our kids. That's going to be a huge push of, uh, of mine moving into the next term if I get reelected. So uh, please give me one of your two votes on no November 2nd for at-large school committee member. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And we have um, our candidates all tonight are uh, seated alphabetically, but we uh, incorrectly sat uh, uh, Councillor Doherty and Mike Dillon just uh, um, apologize for that. And we're going to uh, make our way through. Thank you so much. Um, so Connie Martin, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Connie Martin. 
Um, I've been serving on the Lowell School Committee now. I'm in my 22nd year. Uh, it has been a very long and very powerful education for me, uh, serving in this role, learning about the city from the perspective of students, parents, families, and the greater constituency here in the city who are all connected, <coughs> excuse me, and responsible for the quality of education here in the city of Lowell. Uh, again, during that time, I've done my best, again, to do my homework, to look at this as serious work that needs to be done. Uh, and I think that one of the most critical aspects of our education system is the recognition that there is absolutely no great stride forward that this city can take if it's not based on the quality of our educational system. So I would ask, come November 2nd, to please consider me for one of your two votes for the at-large seats for the Lowell School Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Ben O'Para. Hello, my name is Ben O'Para. I am your candidate for District 1 of uh, Law School Committee. I, uh, District 1 is a combination of City Council Districts 1 and 8, which are uh, Patuckettville and the Highlands. I've run a couple of times unsuccessfully though <coughs> for School Committee at large, when it was at large, but with the new districting, it brings a new variety of, uh, of challenges which I am willing to confront. Now, I'm a resident of Portoketville. I have lived in Portoketville for um, over 20 years. I'm a father of three. All my three children went through Lowell Public Schools. Our entire public school system in Lowell also proceeded to a uh, public university in Amherst, both of them. Uh, my lovely wife, Valerie, is, is my guide and light in everything that essentially that I do. She's the anchor woman that I have in the house that keeps my house in check and in control while I run around. Now, after one of my unsuccessful bids to Lowell School Committee, I was you know, able to re-engage, and I have always re-engaged and always engaged the city. I led the city, uh, city CY Baron Council for a couple of years uh, before I ran again. So I, you know, I, I, I ask you for one of your two votes uh, in Portoketville and the Highlands because I will represent our neighborhood, bearing in mind that it's all about our children. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate uh, Peters. Hi, I'm Jim Peters. I've lived in the city for 44 years. Uh, no, I've lived in the city for 50 years. I forgot. Um, I uh, was a U.S. Ma US uh, UMass Lowell uh, teacher, and I was the citywide parent council uh, chairman back in 1980, which is a long time ago. And um, it's been very in, in ennobling getting to know all of these people in the city that, that, that had such a, uh, a uh, great desire to please everybody. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, thing about Lowell. And uh, last year I said, uh, isn't Lowell, Lowell's some, some place to love? And uh, I still stick by that. I, I, I believe that Lowell is a place to love. And uh, people do incredible things here so thank you thank you Jim and last we have Stacy Thompson good evening and thank you for the organizers of this event really excited to be able to be here today and for those of you who are watching live and those of you who will watch later I thank you for setting aside the time you know I think that a race is won by deciding who you know and oftentimes that's by name recognition, but it needs to go beyond that. It needs to go into what the person has done, what they are doing, and what they will do. So let me tell you about Stacy Thompson. What I have done is I was a teacher for 11 years. Eight of those years were in, in Lowell, and I was able to not only just teach to the test, but I was also able to do things like get them engaged in civics, bringing them down to City Hall and getting them registered to vote, teaching them how to advocate for themselves. What I'm doing is right now I'm doing the same thing as I'm continuing to make sure that voices are amplified in the city of Lowell and I did so last year in making sure that racism as a public health crisis was a rally that I was able and honored to host. 
what I hope to do and what I hope to do as your candidate for District 1 school committee member, which is again Pawtucketville and the Upper Highlands, is I hope to make sure that there's equity, there's excellence in education, and there's empowerment for our students. So that is what I hope to do. I hope to gain your vote on November 2nd. And any questions you have, please go to stacyforlowell.com. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. So again, just to reiterate, uh, we have two minutes per question per candidate, total of, t of 15 minutes per question. And each candidate, um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to respond a little bit, just one minute tops if necessary. Um, so our first question goes to Jackie Doherty from George. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Jack Willen, this is for you. <laughs> Are you vaccinated? And how would you rate the school department's response to it? Well, thank you, George, for that question. I'm not sure where I'm looking. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, I am absolutely vaccinated uh, because of my work. I'm a frontline worker with uh, severely disabled children and their families, so I was vaccinated early. Um, I think that we have done uh, a good job in terms of trying to educate our, our families and our staff uh, about what the challenges were uh, in, around COVID and keeping people safe. Um, I would have liked more support from the state when the vaccine first rolled out to be able to make our our teachers and frontline workers at the, the front of the line. But that's all in hindsight. I think as we go forward, um, I'm looking for numbers and how many, how, what percentage of our staff are vaccinated. Um, I know from my work with families across the state that you have some schools, you know, or private schools where they've got over 94% vaccination of staff. You have schools where they're holding clinics at the high school to make it easier for students <coughs> to get vaccinated. These would be things I'd want to see moving forward because I believe it is incumbent on us that we know by being vaccinated, by wearing masks in closed quarters, uh, by hand washing and hygiene, these efforts are going to help us get control um, of this uh, disease and be able to get it so that we can go back to normal. So I think that it's important to be vaccinated to practice whatever social distancing and masking and whatever measures we can uh, to keep not only ourselves, but members in the community safe, especially when you're working with families where it, it could be a, a death sentence. Thank, Thank you. you. And the, continue uh, the question continues to each candidate. So Mike Dillon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I find that question to be very interesting in a school committee debate, and I don't know what it has to do with being a school committee member, but uh, no, I am not vaccinated. Uh, I'm a firefighter, and I've been working with the community straight through this whole pandemic, um, and I find it uh, odd that vaccine status is something that we are even talking about right now. Uh, I think we've done, uh, I don't think we've done a very good job with um, virus protocols during this whole uh, pandemic. Um, I think the fact that we still have masks on our kids um, is a sad state of affairs. And I think that, it, you know, had we a year and a half ago put a real focus on physical fitness and mental health and making sure that everybody is, is healthy and, and um, uh, has a, <laughs> a strong body and a strong mind. I mean, that's our, that's our way out of this pandemic. Um, so vaccine status, no, I've already had COVID and I've already recovered from COVID. Um, so I'm not gonna let that control my life. Um, that's all I got on that. Thank you very much. Connie, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the short answer, yes, I am vaccinated. Was vaccinated as soon as it was possible for me to be vaccinated. Uh, I had seniors who I was uh, taking care of and, and other members both in work and, and in my uh, personal life uh, that I felt it was important that it was one more level of protection that I could offer, not just to myself, but to the people who I work with and, and the people in my life. Uh, I do think from the school's perspective, I think we are in a position where with our mask mandate now, with the vaccine that's available for certainly all staff, but also for our older students, looking forward to when our younger students will have access to the vaccine as well. 
uh, I think, you know, when we look at this as the public he health crisis that it is, the critical word in that is public. And it's really something that impacts every single member of our community. And I think every layer of protection that we can bring to bear to keep ourselves, our families, our students, our seniors safe is exactly the steps we should be taking. Uh, and I think from the information I've been able to uh, have access to both publicly and, and in terms of being a member of the school committee as well, uh, I've recognized that it is the layering of protections that offers the most, uh, the most kind of uh, comprehensive uh, approach that will keep our students safe, keep them in school, which I think is a very, very high priority, certainly for me and I know for many others, uh, keep our staff safe, and overall keep our community safe. Here in our city, we do not have high vaccination rates. Uh, we are still seeing significant cases, uh, so this is not over yet. Uh, and again, as I look at each part of the, the attack of this uh, against this disease, I think vaccines are certainly a very, very important important tool in the tool chest. Well done, right at two minutes. Thank you so much. And Ben Opara, go ahead. Well, um, yes, short answer is yes. I have been vaccinated. Um, I, I got the one shot dose. Um, and with my understanding and study of a couple of years of microbiology and virology, I believe that vaccination is the way out of this pandemic. I came from a country that looked up to this country as the bastion of civilization that does things dependent upon advice from the experts. So every expert indicates that vaccination is the way out of this, and I believe it. It is the resistance to vaccination that is causing this pandemic to not to go away, because we just cannot establish herd immunity. Without herd immunity, this thing will keep going back and forth and now we are dealing with the delta variety any time from now we could get another variety and this will continue this is not just with this covid this is the standard um activity and action of viruses out there if you don't treat them and shut them down quickly they mutate so i have been vaccinated Regarding how this district has, our school district together with our city has handled this issue, I think they have handled it the best they can, knowing that this is nuanced to all of us. This is a new channel, this is a new learning, a new experience for, for all of us. So based on the circumstances at hand, I really, I really think I will give them an A for what they've done. Nobody else can, you know, it will be a line experience Thank you, ben. otherwise. Thank you. I'll ask that we allow everyone to complete their statements. So, Jim Peters, thank Hi, you. I'm Jim Peters. Um, I have been vaccinated. I do want to say, though, that I have a brother, brother who um, was a very good citywide uh, baseball player, but he is known for the fact that he hasn't been vaccinated yet because he's not ready for it. So I can understand and, and uh, feel what Mike's talking about. Um, it's, um, I think vaccination is important. I think that, uh, I feel better b having been vaccinated than I would have if I had not, had not. And that's just a, um, a, 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 uh, an opinion of mine. Um, I think that, uh, we have to take care of our kids and we have to make sure that somehow the kids get touched by something that's going to cure them later on in in, uh, in, in their years in school and uh, it's necessary to do what we can do to keep everybody safe and happy and healthy and that's exactly what I'm striving for all right thank you Jim Stacy Thompson same question 
Um, short answer, yes, I've been vaccinated. I was actually vaccinated as soon as possible because, and the reason being is because I did not want to be the person that um, hurt my mother. Um, I, I want to make sure that she was healthy and safe and I felt like that was the best decision for me um, to do so. Um, you know, the reality of it is vaccines um, for some people are scary, medicine is scary, but when you listen to the scientists that break it down, um, they do so because they want to make sure that a city like Lowell is able to keep their kids in school. And I know for so many parents, they suffered last year trying to pivot, trying to understand how to do what they were to you know, get their kids educated. And you had teachers, and I want to thank the teachers and the staff who were able to pivot in such a traumatic year. Um, was it done perfectly? Absolutely not. You know, again, hindsight, 2020, there, there's so much that people learned as things were happening. Um, but again, I think that it's important to make sure that, um, you know, that the students are protected, that they can be in school because, you know, they lost so much by not being able to be with one another. So for you have to have a vaccination, you have the opportunity to, again, keep the kids in school. Yes, they're masked. And I will be the first one to tell you I'm tired of the masks. But it's another um, another thread of protection to, you know, stop the virus from spreading in the way that it has. So please, if you haven't, consider it. And um, I, I'm a vaccine supporter. Thank you. Thank can you, I, everyone. Can I, can I take my minute of rebuttal here? Y yes, yeah. I'll open for one minute. And we are going to keep very close eye on the time. So I will be cutting people off if Thank necessary. You. Thank well, you. Well, I have to um, really say that I understand where Mike is coming from. And there are many people like, like that. It is important for us to recognize where they are coming from and not just you know, uh, uh, either brush them aside or, but we have to recognize where they're coming from and there are many people like that. Where I think we should have, we, we have work to do is to find ways of letting people know and educating people, having some talk so people really will understand. So people have gray, gray areas, especially with this new vaccine the way it came out and so on. So people have concern, but it is good to, you know, use, you know, um, be compassionate to those, to people that are doubting the efficacy of this and really understand the science. But it's, it's our work to do to really explain things to that segment of the population. Thank you, Ben. Um, Mike, would you so like to respond? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, well, now that we've divided in the, the room into vaxxed and unvaxxed, um, I, I just have a question for anybody in here that would like to answer it. Does anybody know if natural immunity is um, as good or not as good as a vaccine? Can anybody tell me? I, please, I would please. love a I'd love a follow up uh, answer by anybody on that. And where I'm coming from uh, is since March 2020. Uh, I did, I did CPR on a COVID victim in March 2020. Then I was a little scared. As this thing has gone on, uh, I just heard somebody mention fear of vaccines. I am not afraid of this virus. The fear out there and in this room apparently is of the virus. Uh, so I've been at work while everybody else was at home working remotely without a, vi without a vaccine for this whole time and I don't need to get the vaccine, and now I'm the isolated one in the room. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any further responses? Go ahead, Stacey Thompson. What I will say is that, you know, healthcare is an important thing, and obviously it's a personal decision. But when I look at the statistics, and I will tell you, for me, before I actually did get the vaccine, I actually spoke to a friend of mine who's a virologist and an epidemiologist because I want to know more information. So I did seek out information because I think that's important. I don't think we should blindly do anything. Um, and when I did that, I felt more at peace with the decision that I made. Um, as far as you know, it being our natural um, immunity, uh, again, that's not what the science says. And for so many things, you know, it, that's not my expertise. So I'm going to trust the experts on that. And that's what I'll lean to. And I think that that's um, a, a good way to, to, for us to, you know, be able to express that to our children and to the community at large. Thank you, Stacy. I see candidate Peters. Um, I just wanted to answer Mike's question. Uh, the uh, uh, ABC News, World News, uh, with David Muir, stated that 
the uh, kind of the uh, vac not the vaccine, but the uh, co coded co COVID um, cell lasts for three months. Genetic code. The genetic code of the cell lasts for three months, so it, it's it's a three month time that you have to your, to be safe. Um, whether or not it's that's just the only thing that I, I have no idea. All right, thank you. Anyone who hasn't responded, otherwise we'll go on to the next question. Okay, <coughs> thanks so much. So that question was from the planning panel. The next question is from the public and Vladimir will pose it to Mike Dillon. Absolutely. So on the theme of health, overall health, do you think racism is a public health crisis? This is the first two questions that we're starting with. Um, no, I don't believe that racism is a public health crisis. Um, I don't. I don't know really where the statement started um, that racism is a public health crisis, um, but it just seems. Um, it just seems. Uh, I don't know. Odd to me that we are in a pandemic, um, and we're also still dealing with this opioid crisis that kills people every single day. Um, and according to the changing definitions over the years of racism, um, I, I think that maybe ha has to do with um, why this notion that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, because, you know, everything is racism now. Um, you know, uh, we're talking about systems that are uh, um, made from uh, racist beginnings. Uh, you know, racism is really a thought in somebody's head that they the color of their skin makes them superior to people with different color skin, you know. And I don't think there's much going around in Lowell uh, as people make make it out to be. The reason why I stayed in the city is because it's a tough town, and there are all kinds of people here, people of every walk of life. And that's the type of place that I want to live in, and that's the type of place that I want to raise my kids in because I think it's beneficial in um, you know millions of ways. But uh, no, I. I disagree that, that racism is a public health, health crisis. Thank you. Okay. Connie Martin. Thank you very much. Um, I do believe the statement that racism is a public health crisis. I believe it strongly enough that both myself and my colleague Ms. Doherty made the motion on the school committee floor uh, to declare it a public health crisis in our schools. Um, and it was a motion that did pass on the, the school committee side while it did not pass on the city council side. Um, I think that any conversation around racism really is a conversation about power and ultimately particularly when we're talking about healthcare systems there is a power element that is part of it and it does put people uh, people of color it does put uh, uh, minorities it puts whole groups of people at a disadvantage in trying to access those most basic needs of getting appropriate health care coverage for themselves and their families uh, I think the motion as we stated it uh, that several months ago, quite a while ago I guess now, on the school committee floor really talked about not only the health aspect of it but the educational aspect of it, uh, which is obviously I think pretty appropriate for a school committee. Um, and I think the recognition that there are systemic problems in our district that are no different from every other district in this country that are grappling with the same issues. Uh, and I think the difference we can make here in Lowell is being able to look at these issues clear-eyed and uh, really do the important work that comes from recognizing that there's a problem. Because every time we brush a problem under the, under the carpet, it will always come back 10 times worse. It takes real courage, I think, to be able to look at it as a problem and to be able to recognize whatever role we may play in it uh, and be able to work together to find real solutions for our students and our families here in the city. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Ben Opara. Yes. Um, racism is, a, I agree, is a public health crisis. I come to this from different angles. Um, first of all, I have to commend the current school committee for their vote on that that they really acknowledged and looked at that case holistically to recognize that racism indeed is a public health crisis. The might of the vote 
on the civil council, I will tell you this, and I watch all those meetings diligently, was perhaps the saddest evening of my life in a long time when they voted that motion down. I lost friends. I was troubled by it. I had conversations with some of them, and we came to agree that, indeed, we had the right to disagree on that. So yes, racism is a public health crisis, but you have to look at it from the viewpoint of the people that are complaining about this to be able to understand it. Because if you don't feel it, you wouldn't understand it. So what we urge people to do is don't be defensive, but rather listen. Listen, have two ears but keep one mouth. So in other words, you listen more or you talk less. It is an experience. It is a form of epiphany of sorts. When some of us challenged and took Black Lives Matter as a mantra in this city, when nobody wanted to touch it, but we did, because we Thank urge you, people to listen more instead of... Thank you, Ben. We'll move on to Jim Peters. Thank you. Yes, I have, um, I have a great many feelings about uh, racism. I grew up in Chicago, and uh, I didn't grow up in a... Uh, I grew up in a, in a very mixed town, 50-50. And uh, it was eye-opening. And I had a tenant in Lowell. I had a two family. I had a tenant in Lowell that came to me and asked me if she could uh, rent my two family. And I said yes, and she was black. And that night, a man crossed the street while I was standing there watching her, crossed the street with a, a uh, fire can and said that he was going to use it on my house. And the next night, the man came in with a brick and threw it through the window. We're not above racism in law. Racism in law is a problem. And I stand very clearly on it and want people to understand that Racism in Lowell is, it can be a problem, and, and we have to deal with it. And uh, we can't stand around and say, well, this person's this color, and this person's that color, and that makes us all the better. It's got to be worked out as a group. And we need to do things as a group. And uh, I would just like to see it go away. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Stacy Thompson, same question. I indeed do believe that racism is a public health crisis because I live it. I speak from lived experience. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to host the rally last year um, as racism as a public health crisis, and I have to thank so many organizations. We had 1,500 organizations and people that signed on to the letter of racism as a public health crisis. And the thing that was interesting is that we spoke to the scientists. And the scientists explained the very way in which it affects people of color, people that look like me. So it's hard to hear when someone would quantify opioid addiction as a crisis or homelessness as a crisis, which I have lived through, okay? But they don't quantify my lived experience when I walk down Merrimack Street and someone screams at me the N-word and then I have to go to work and be friendly and chipper and I have that weight on me and that knot in my stomach all day long. It's a public health crisis and the reality of it is if you want to know about it, it's not saying you're a racist, it's saying learn from my lived experience. Ask me, we will talk about it. I have no problem talking to you about it because people that look like me are experts in that field. Thank you. Can I borrow one, one minute here yeah, on the bottle? Oh, Jackie didn't go yet. That's right. <laughs> Jacqueline Dory. Uh, thank you. Yes, as uh, Ms. Mar Martin mentioned, it was uh, a year ago in August uh, 2020 that we had the joint motion 
that was passed by the majority of the school committee that racism is a national health crisis. Um, I followed that up with a motion in July of this year, July 21, which also passed uh, by a majority, asking for a report from the school department on efforts to provide more inclusive curriculum. Uh, because as the schools, we are looking at obviously the education piece, and I think it is an important piece as we work as a community to really overturn uh, what have been discriminatory practices for centuries in this country. And, uh, and a lot of us, you know, when we went to school, we learned about the civil rights movement, and you think, oh, that's all in the past, uh, you know, that this discrimination. But as I'm learning more and more, um, I understand and I, and I can respect my colleagues who spoke earlier, our candidates, about listening with both ears. When the city had that um, listening session, it was eye-opening for me when I saw the Black Lives Matter movement come out. It was eye-opening for me because I think if you're a white-skinned person, you don't experience racism. Not that kind of overt racism. So you have to be looking outside your own circle of experience to be open to understanding that to me the national health crisis is not necessarily that hateful overt racist person who yells a comment or treats someone disrespectfully it's the people like myself who feel we're not racist we're trying to live together in peace and make progress but are not willing to acknowledge there, that there are systematic problems and issues that are keeping one group down while advantaging another group. We need to open our eyes to that. And I'm going to use the housing example for health because if you have higher rates of asthma, I think I'll have to cut you, you off in, now. But thank you, Jacqueline. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you, Jacqueline. I will say in furtherance that I will take myself as an example. I came to this country and subsequently enrolled in graduate school at my, f my favorite school right down the road here. And I experienced it firsthand. And I know that I'm not a weak student. And people that have, that have sat in class with me can attest to that. But in that particular course, I came this close to flunking it and it affected my psyche almost permanently. So, and then I was 28 years old. I was able to, to handle it. So my worry is about my children in their formative years. How are they able to handle this? And this is the story that we people of color tell when we have this quote unquote discussion with our children. This is what we want people to Thank you, just Glenn. pay attention to and listen some more. Thank you so much. So I see Mike Dillon is requesting one minute, and then Jacqueline Doherty, if there's anyone else, let me know. Um, thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> I guess one question that I have is what has come from recognizing racism as a public health crisis? Um, I don't think that anything has come from that vote. I think that it is was strictly a political show and I think that's what a lot of this kind of talk has turned into um, and we're talking about this is just a difference in language public health crisis um, you know you, you, you can't say that no that racism does not exist I mean that's not what anybody is saying that says uh, you know racism is not a public health crisis but uh, rather than just sit here and only get one minute to speak I would uh, you know, invite anybody to have a long conversation on camera with me um, anytime leading up, you know, maybe to the election uh, because nobody really wants to touch this issue and I will talk on it. I will speak to anybody on it and I, I would welcome a long form uh, discussion because um, the only thing that I think Thank is you, right Mike. going and on right now is that Jackie we will have the, yes. the next follow up. Go ahead, Jackie. Uh, thank you. So, uh, in response to that question, I think that. All these efforts to kind of take a hard eye, eye look at what have been housing, criminal justice, uh, education, what have been the systematic, uh, systemic problems uh, that have continued to um, keep one group from having the same opportunities as another group. I think that is the only way forward. It's the only way is to understand 
uh, you know, I have these benefits that you didn't have. And to, if without realizing that, we can't move forward. And I, I want to just give one example that for me was an epiphany. When all that Black Lives Matter stuff was coming out, and I was reading reports about how um, mothers of color would say to their sons, if you get pulled over by the police, keep your hands on the wheel. Like, I don't know if you've seen any of this, right? And I'm thinking about how I spoke to my children about if you ever get pulled over for a traffic violation. Thank you, Jackie. Never worried about their lives. Was Thank you. Worried about getting a ticket. All right. It's different. I have seen Stacy Thompson request a follow-up. Shortly put, inequities are real, and they exist in many of the ways that um, Jackie Darty just spoke about. You know, if you haven't experienced it, I get why you may question it. I get why it may not seem like um, you know a thing to you, but it is a real thing because people are sick; they experience things differently. Your body, and, and again, I'm not a scientist, so I would implore you to reach out to places like the GLHA. They have statistics uh, you know that are really clear and concise that can really give you that but I would also say to Mr. Dillon that I do welcome that opportunity to speak to you on camera about it um, because I think this is important for people to potentially hear and I'm hoping that people will be able to um, understand where why that's really a thing and what where it comes from because it's not a political gimmick it's life and it's my life Right. Uh, we can do it on Peter's principles um, anytime one, you guys want one to. One second, um, Jim Peters. Sorry to cut you off, but if, if you're requesting a minute, let me know. Oh, I, I'm i sorry. I just I just said if, if uh, they want to have a show. I'm sure we'll we be have able to set that up. It's Absolutely. called Peter's principles, and <laughs> okay. it's, it shoots in here. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Okay. I see Connie Martin is requesting a follow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think just, you know, again, as we, we have these conversations, it's important to note that when you're looking at the social determinants of health and the overwhelming uh, documentation of how, where somebody lives, what kind of job they have access to, what their access to transportation to is, all these things have an impact on people's health. And all of these things are impacted by racism in one way or another. I think the key thing, and again, I think for many of us, we've gone through kind of a period of what I hope is self-discovery. Uh, I think trying to learn more about the, the world we're part of and what role we can play in it, both positive, hopefully moving forward, and recognizing whatever negative uh, aspects we may have had. You know, the key for me was recognizing that this is not a personal affront, that my taking the time to understand what white privilege is, and, and what role it plays in the world I'm part of, uh, for me, was really very, uh, was a really important process, and I think Thank it really you, helped Connie. inform my understanding of this All issue right. in a much more We're going to move to the next question now. Thank you. Sorry. Right. I always go over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question, we start with uh, Ms. Connie Martin. There's a notable amount of data indicating significant disparities in student achievements for Hispanic and Latino students. How would you address this to make it more equitable? First off, I wish I had the, the short point of the sword answer. I really do. And I wish there really was one that could give us a, a, a quick answer to, to solve this problem. Um, the statistics are absolutely there. You see them in Lowell, you see them across the country. Uh, so, you know, seeing these kind of achievement gaps absolutely have to be one of the, the most important things that we need to pay attention to. Uh, again, I don't pretend I have the answer, but I do think that some of the efforts that are underway currently in trying to bring more uh, culturally uh, appropriate materials into our school, introducing our curriculum and ensuring that it has a representation of kind of cross-cultural materials, I think recognizing and respecting the different languages, the different cultural experiences that our students come from, uh, that needs to be part of what we, we celebrate and what we focus on in our schools. Um, I also think that there are, again, systemic problems within educational systems where you can look at the number of suspensions, uh, other things like that where discipline does not appear to be uh, meted out uh, equally across across school populations. That's something that I know uh, is being addressed uh, but needs continued focus. Um, 
And I think that more than anything, it's being able to ensure that in our schools we're willing and we're capable of having thought-provoking conversations uh, across all different uh, areas of, of concern that are respectful uh, and that we're able to kind of teach our students not just to, to parrot back information but to be able to learn and critically uh, analyze information so that every every challenge that comes in front of them they're able to address. Thank you Connie. Ben. Well yes the statistics are there I agree but then we know by experts and people in education across the board that children at very young age pick up things that they can identify with or something or someone that looks like them. So what are we going to do about correcting, you know, bridging that gap? Perhaps look at what is being done now both in training for teachers and parents and staff uh, be able to align uh, these children to something that they are familiar with. There are so many ways that we can deal with, with these things. I don't claim to be an expert. I, I will see things and make my judgment based on the statistics at hand. But are the disparity, disparity is there? Yes, we understand that. And it is part of that also that I see a normal trend right now with you know school boards and you know superintendents across board, and that is why I think we are in, in good hands here. We are on the right trajectory. We can still do better. I will look into how we can do better by at least, but because the first one of the first protocols that the current superintendent did was to hire um, an equity and diversity you know head. Um, at least to show that we can begin to do something in that regard. These are ways that we can look out and look outward to see how we can inf influence these children who are at early stages of their life to be able to, to learn things and pick things up from people or areas that they are familiar with. Thank you, Ben. Candidate Jim Peters. Hi. If, um I have a fault it's that I speak too quickly and it gets a little mixed up. But uh, the uh, fact is that I think that we should, as a nation, start to think about having two languages in the, uh, being used in the United States. You know, one would be Spanish and one would be English. And uh, I think that uh, people are scared of the idea of, of a, 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 a Spanish-speaking group, but we're not a Spanish-speaking group. It would just be uh, people learning a little bit about Spanish. I was a teacher for 15 years. I was a pr principal for two years, and I was a, uh, a teacher again for in another, another school for three years. And so I had 20 years' experience. And one day I was standing outside of my room listening to these kids talking and they were talking in Spanish and I turned around and said, what are you, what are you going to do? And one of them said, you can speak Spanish and they all disappeared. And uh, I, I, I'm not great at Spanish, but I can understand it. And uh, I think we need to have people who touch, who go to both uh, areas. And uh, we need to teach English, we need to teach Spanish. And uh, I, I, I don't think we can get the 61 uh, voice, uh, the 61, uh, uh, never mind. It's, 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 it's okay. Thank you, Jim. So I can't remember what the 61 is. Maybe it'll, it'll come back. Languages? Circle back. Oh. It might be language. Yeah, yeah language is probably it, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Stacy Thompson, same question. And this question does come from the community. Well, thank you for this question. 
The Latinx community, as I've reached out to them and have reached out to me, has definitely expressed this as an issue. And so I'm really, um, I'm really glad to be able to speak about it today. And I do have some really concrete ideas. What I will say is it's not going to be you know, something that happens right away. It's because it's systemic and it has been existent for so long, there's lots of steps that need to take place. But a few ideas. There needs to be more staffing. Um, you know, the reality of it is there needs to be more staffing so that language access is more fluid. I also have an idea for a pilot program, which is a curriculum development program. And in that, I would like to include social workers, a curriculum development expert, parents, teachers, students, because I feel like that, that richness will allow for them to see their education look and feel different. They'll feel more invested, so they'll be more successful. In addition to that, I feel like there needs to be evaluation of the system as it exists. What are the teachers doing? What's been successful? What's failed? And we need to have that accountability, and, and that's okay. We need to just check it, and if it's not working, we need to fix it. There needs to be a, a true training, not a surface level training, but an ongoing training so that the Latinx community feels heard and seen and validated in their um, school system. Um, advocacy. I think it's important to make sure that the parents as well as the students know how to advocate for themselves so that they feel like, you know, this, the situations, the issues that are important to them are heard and are, are in there. And then there needs to be a diversity in hiring and not just on a, a racial level but on a culturally sensitive level. There has to be a social emotional learning component to what goes on and that's going to be what makes, um, you know, that successful. As you know, they're looking to pass a culturally and linguistically sustainability practices program, the CLSP. And that's going to be something that teachers are looking for because it gives them support to be able to deliver the services that they really need to so that our Latinx community feels more supported. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have all the candidates um, finish. I know, I know. Thank you, guys. Um, before anyone, as someone's re requested a minute. So go ahead, Jacqueline Doherty. Uh, thank minutes. you. And I guess a lot of has been covered that I would add to. I think the first thing to think about when you look at the achievement gaps that we've seen, uh, and it's not just in Lowell, it is across the country, um, that much of it is a socioeconomic issue as well. And I think that whatever we do in school without wraparound services, uh, it's going to be limited progress. But that doesn't mean there aren't things that we can and should and are currently trying to do. So I'm just going to go through the numbers as I put them, and I think that some of it was mentioned uh, by some of the earlier speakers as well. I think, first of all, the diversity in staffing is a part of it because when children have role models that they can look to, uh, teachers that look like them, that have similar uh, backgrounds and understanding, uh, not only do they engage with that teacher better, but they also have a sense of, I could be that. That could be a future for me. So I think the diversity in staffing is very important, and we are making strides in that area. Uh, it was also mentioned about professional development for staff and leaders. I think that should be an ongoing um, and really enriching program where people are listening and learning from each other, uh, not only about issues about how to connect with students from different backgrounds, but also issues around behavior and um, setting up programs in school so that all the adults are on the same page about helping our children to behave appropriately uh, within school because I think that's an ongoing issue that you end up having people you know being suspended or separated from the classes and it's not working it's not a system that's teaching them how to behave better so that we can learn together better um, and I think that really leads to the whole engaging students piece if we have curriculum that they can access, that they're interested in, um, and that there are opportunities, whether it's art, music, athletics, other things about school that can tap into their interests and get them excited. And lastly, although I don't consider this last at all on the list, but inviting and welcoming parents and really continually reaching out to them because they Thank are you, key players in our ability to move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, Mike Dillon, and if anyone at any time wants us to repeat a question, we can certainly do that. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting we talk about achievement gaps uh, because during this whole pandemic, we've done nothing but um, widen those gaps for uh, our most vulnerable kids. Uh, we kept them out of the building for an uh, amount of time that was uh, beyond anything that uh, a kid should ever have to endure uh, and to put a kid in a remote learning situation in their own home when their own home is um, a terrifying place to most people 
Uh, that is a sad state of affairs. And, and we allowed our kids, no matter what color their skin is, kids that don't have it as good as us, we allowed them to sit at home and not be provided the services that our kids can provide them. Um, I also think that you know this achievement gap by racial groups um, is a multivariable issue. We can't just say racism, um, and we can't also can't uh, rule out that our teachers are damn good at what they do, and they do get across to kids for, that look different than them, and kids that look different than them can learn from them. I think they do an excellent job at it. So I don't know that those. I'm more interested in telling our kids that nothing's going to hold them back in life and, and providing them with competence because that is how kids become confident. I think every single kid should be a confident and competent human being coming out of our school system. Thank you. So that is all of the candidates' initial responses. Any? Okay. It seems like we can go to the next question. Thank you so much. Vladimir. Perfect. Um, so the next question is for Mr. Opara, and this question is, do you prefer busing over neighborhood schools, or do you have a preferred model for the city? Well, the first question is, how did we get to busing? Is by a consent decree, if I, if I recollect. Um, is being work in progress. Yes, we have made a lot of achievement in that, but we cannot rest on our laurels. So I am on the outside looking in. It is the jury is still out on that to really understand the dynamics and the pros and cons of busing alongside you know neighborhood schools. I know this is a burning issue with most of um, people that I have spoken to during my, you know, door-to-door. Uh, -door. But my answer to that is the jury is still out on this. I don't have an opinion because I really need to look at the totality <coughs> of the issue. Um, a lot has been achieved um, through busing against, you know, neighborhood schools. And my dream and expectation and hope is that we continue to achieve those and do better. It doesn't help for us to retrogate. So it is something that I just have difficulty zeroing in an opinion because I think that it is work in progress. And I am on the outside looking in when I, uh, by your you know, support, and you know, hope that you vote for me. If I get in as a school committee member, I will be able to know more things and see things firsthand, be able to make the right judgment. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Next uh, candidate, Jim Peters. I um, um, believe that uh, I sat through the busing argument back in the early 1980s or the late 1970s when my brother-in-law was a U.S. Senator in, the, in uh, the Capitol and he was for busing and I am for neighborhood schools. So it's important that we have um, a busing option to make sure that all the kids get to school but it's also important that we, we, we try to get some kids to go to neighborhood schools and feel free to feel good about being in school and being in the school that's down in the neighborhood. I picked out my house because it was a block from the Maury School. It was a block from St. Margaret's Church. And I, it reminded me of a town that I grew up in in, Coralville, in Cosgrove, Iowa, that had 27 people in it. And uh, not many people have a town that they could talk about that's got 27 people in it. But uh, it's, it's just, uh, busing uh, is important. Uh, I agree with Paul on par part of it, but I disagreed with him on some of it too. So um, that was my stance. Thank you. Stacy Thompson. 
I think this is absolutely one of these dividing questions and I've as I've been canvassing as I've been door knocking and meeting with people it's been something that we've talked about for me it boils down to equity and I feel like if the schools across the board across the, the, the city had that sameness you know if the experience was the same it may not <coughs> be or have had this be have been an issue from the beginning um, and so I think that that's really more so the issue. I went to a neighborhood school. I didn't grow up in Lowell, but I went to a neighborhood school, so I understand that experience. But the, the benefit of schools in Lowell is there's such diversity among the schools. Um, and based on where you are in certain neighborhoods, you're not going to really feel that diversity in the same way. So that could be the benefit of indeed having the busing experience. I get it. I get, you know, if you're living in a certain area or expecting your kids to like go to school with their next their neighbor and play together and all those things. Uh, so I understand that, but I do think there is potentially a benefit from um, busing as well. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to Jacqueline Dory. Uh, thank you. I think the busing versus neighborhood schools always seems like it's so simple, like just pick one or the other, but it's actually very complex. And in Lowell, we have a consent decree which says we are going to have diversity. We're going to have a balance of uh, different types of people, people of color, people of distant so socioeconomic backgrounds at each of our schools. Uh, we also bus the charter school students. We bus the parochial school students. And we have citywide schools, meaning that you can go to a school uh, that's on one end of the city when you live in the other. So when we look at, and we try to balance that by having neighborhood schools, like if, if your sc school you can see from your street and that's your first choice, that's going to give you a more weighted chance of getting into your neighborhood school. But it's all this complicated equation of looking at all these other weights and balances. So I think we need, and we have been trying for a few years to really tackle this issue because if we're going to have a citywide school in one zone of the city then we should in the other zone because that issue of equity also comes into play you shouldn't be denied options because of the neighborhood you live in you should be able to have all the other all the options equally in the different neighborhoods so given all that it's a very complicated issue it's something we need to uh, keep working on for me the, uh, the idea of having balance and having diversity in each of our schools is an important priority. So that would be something that I would want to keep no matter how w other ways we come to configure the issue of busing and neighborhood schools. But um, I think that when we look at it, it seems like it's simple on the surface, but it really is much more complicated if you value having equity and diversity in all our schools. And I, and I think that there are even neighborhoods that don't have enough kids in that neighborhood. They'd have to bus them to fill the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Dillon. Um, thank you, yeah, and this is something that I have been uh, talking about since I got elected last time, uh, and I've been pushing for is a move back to um, schools closer to home, creating walkable uh, walkable opportunities for our kids. Um, really building our communities back up is, is a huge part of it for me. Um, I, I've just over this term, I've talked to plenty of people who live on a street where every kid on the street goes to a different school in the city. And you know, we, all, we complain about not our kids not being outside playing. Well, they don't know the kids in their own neighborhood. Their friends are all over the city. And you know that makes that makes it difficult for a, a community to be strong, um, and, and kids on the same street playing together, parents knowing each other, parents having easy access to the school themselves, um, particularly parents who aren't well off. Um, you know they have they will have closer access or could have closer access. Um, you know we have a fair student funding process where um, we put extra money. Um, to our schools that are called our renaissance schools that are struggling schools in order and we give them extra resources and, and staff in order to bring them up. Um, so we're on a path to make sure that all of our schools are providing a valuable education around the city and also we just changed to a dis district representation model. So we're electing politicians onto the school committee from our own district that your kid doesn't even necessarily go to a school in that district. Um, I, so I think there are lots of benefits um, and never mind the money, you know, and the transportation mess. We're in a mess with transportation right now. And, you know, if we were in a, uh, a situation where kids went 
or uh, had more walkable routes to their school, then a lot of these problems could be uh, mitigated. And I think in the future that that is uh, a way that we should go. Thank you. Thank you. And Connie Martin. Thank you very much. Um, as we look at the, the issue of busing versus neighborhood schools, it is kind of a, 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 a simple way of, of defining what is really a much more complicated and complex problem. Uh, as I look at it, at its very core, it comes down to does Lowell want to have a segregated school system or a desegregated school system? Um, and, and in my mind, the value that comes from having our students uh, from different backgrounds, different, again, socioeconomic uh, situations from the whole kind of breadth of variety that we celebrate in this city uh, and that we recognize is such a critical strength for us, that happens, that begins in our, in our classrooms. Uh, the ability of our students to have friends from across the city, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that you know true equity comes from having uh, that that same opportunity um, in all of our schools across the district but ensuring that there is a healthy mix of students that are all taking part in that educational process uh, there are certainly expenses to transportation that I think we should always be working to pare down uh, but ultimately when you're looking at the percentages of, of different student populations in our schools, ensuring that that is balanced across the board, to me, is one of the most critically important things we do uh, to ensure that all of our students have a fair and equitable uh, education. Okay. Thank you so much. That wraps up the candidate uh, responses to this question. Uh, this will be our last question, and it also comes from the community. I want to thank all the incumbents and candidates um, and again the, the team and everyone here today and everyone watching at home um, so this is our last question oh. Thank you. Um, we'll start this question to mr. Jim Peters uh, how should the city interact with charter schools I went before the Union the last time and uh, was asked that question and uh, I think that uh, charter schools are expensive and not necessarily in, in, in the flavor of what we expect them to be. Um, to some people that are wonderfully flavored and to people like me it's a, it's a waste of money. So in my feeling is that uh, charter schools are a waste of, of, of money and that, that we have to put the kids back in, in normal situa situations. And uh, I know that's kind of conservative, but that's what I believe. And it's not going to change with, uh, in, in, in any time soon. Um, I think that uh, charter schools do have a certain flavor and I like their some of the things that they do but I don't agree with the process the idea of having a charter school so that's my answer thank you Jim Peters Stacy Thompson I think that what the city should be doing is focusing on our public schools I think that our public schools could be all the more rich when there is full attention being paid to them when you start to diversify, you know, the pots of money and where we're already trying to really, um, really stay focused and strategic about how we want to spend the monies that are for the public schools. I think that it's really important that we really invest in them. And there are so many ideas and so many things that could come to fruition without the divestiture of that money. And so I, I, for me, I think to have equity in the public school system, then that needs to be where the, where the focus is. Again, parents have the full, uh, you know, full access to do what it, they, they think is best for their family, but I would ask for them to choose public schools because you're going to get a quality education. We need to focus on them, and I wish the city would do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Doherty. Uh, thank you. So I look at the charter school question really from the lens of a parent, and so um, they are public schools. Uh, my concern with the charter schools is that they're, taking funds away from the mainstream schools. 
but the idea of giving a parent a choice of saying, if you're not happy with the, what the Lowell Public Schools are providing, you have this other option. Um, I would support that. I think they need to be held uh, to the same standards that the traditional public schools are held to, uh, the accountability measures that I hold myself and my uh, administration to. Uh, those things all go with it. But in terms of how I look at the charter schools, um, if it wasn't for the feeling that they're draining our resources, I think that it's an option for parents that I don't have a problem with. And especially if they are, and I think this was really the intention with when charter schools started, that they would be incubators for trying new ways of teaching and new ways of reaching students that would have better results. And if they're doing that, then I want to learn from that and, and use those best cases to bring back to the traditional structure of what we're doing. But to give parents an option, and the difference between a charter school and let's say a parochial or private school option is the check. A parent doesn't have to write a check to choose a charter school. Uh, so from that perspective, I don't have a problem with them. I just want them to be held accountable to the same standards that we are, and I don't want them to be draining our resources uh, because we take all students, not just the parents who choose us. So uh, that means we need the resources to meet all the needs of those students. So that would be my take on charter schools. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mike Dillon, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I I'm actually going to take a second to go back to the neighborhood schools question for uh, uh, briefly. Uh, Latifah Phillips, who was our chief equity officer, uh, we already have these numbers uh, for the neighborhoods in our city. She, she went through and took all our students and put them into the school closest to their home. Uh, she reported back to us there was negligible difference in the uh, diversity around the city in our schools. Our neighborhoods are diversified. If you ask any firefighter in the city, uh, you. In every, build, in every part of the city, every firehouse that you work at, you see every single type of person. Um, so that's just another thing that going back to the neighborhood schools. Um, as far as charter schools go, I, I d can't help um, being a former teacher myself, but think that charter schools are taking away from the education of the public schools. Um, and I hear great things from parents who send their kids to a charter school and they're glad for the opportunity, but um, it, it's stretching our public school systems thin. Um, and they don't have to adhere to all the same uh, policies as the public schools. And um, I, I think that money could be well, well used. Uh, they, don't, they don't face all the same challenges. Um, and I think that, that the public school system could gain a lot of ground um, if they had that money. Thank you. Thank you. Connie Martin. Thank you. Um, I do think that the, the charter schools uh, represent a challenge in terms of how you fairly distribute funding um, educational dollars here in the city and, and beyond um, I think that you know again when you look at the, the parity of populations they are quite different um, most particularly around special education needs which is something that has uh, come up across the Commonwealth with um, the charter schools simply not being equipped to, to provide those services in a lot of cases um, and the public school having no choice but to be equipped um, so that there is a you know there is a, a, a greater strain on a public school system when you're talking about special education needs not just in our classrooms but when you're talking about students who are being um, placed out of district because they have uh, profound needs uh, those are you know in the public school realm we really have to we have to work with every child that comes through the door um, and that's an important part of what public schools truly are all about is ensuring that every child gets uh, access to the the least restrictive uh, environment that will support their learning um, I think the other aspect with charter schools you know and I think they grew out of kind of a, a movement that we kind of used to have here in the city I mean we had incubator schools we had uh, magnet schools where you were really trying out new methods, new, new, new professional development techniques, new curriculum. Um, and that was something that really kind of had put Lowell on the map, particularly with the Graduate School of Education at the university, um, where you were able to, you know, try out in real time uh, new methods of, of pedagogy and, and, again, instructional methods. Uh, I think charter schools were presented as an opportunity for that to happen on a grander scale. 
Um, but what I, I find, you know, over the course of these, you know, 20 or so years since charters have been in place, we haven't seen those innovations making their way back into the public school setting. Um, and I think that was really what certainly I can remember having these conversations of wanting to see the charter schools uh, be those kind of incubators mm -hmm. where great ideas could come out of, Thank but you that time. then we could I all benefit from. Uh, and I haven't seen that that Appreciate come to fruition. Thank yes, you. Um, regarding charter schools, I look at it uh, too proud first. As a parent, I might view it favorably because it gives me a parent and every parent out there the choice to choose. But as a school committee member and looking whose responsibility it is to provide equitable and good education to our students in, in our district, especially in my district of Port and in, in the Highlands, if you so, you know, let me represent you, is it is sapping away funds from the public school system. Also, they have the the ability and the luck to pick and choose who to um, educate that our schools don't have. So it's, in a sense, it is it's like a leech. And I'm sorry to use that word, but it is taking funds away from the public school system. If there are ways that they can, that they can be funded outside of the pool from w which the public school system also pulls. Yes, I agree. But generally, as someone whose responsibility it is to look out for our kids and look out for the welfare and good funding of the public school system, because yes, the general school is a public school. Uh, most people don't know that. But they are on a pedestal of their own. And how they came, came through my research, I know the, the whole process came up from, you know, agreeing with uh, Connie and Jackie, what they said, from, you know, having to, having, being the incubator um, environment. But that hasn't materialized. So, in a sense, they're actually sucking away funds from the public school system. And for that, I have reservation Thank you, ben. towards you know, so the school. We have a little time if there's a response. I see Mike Dillon is requesting one minute. Um, yeah, thank you. I just want to take the last minute to, uh, you know, the, the word diversity get thrown around here a lot tonight, and I think diversity of thought is the thing that we really need to be thinking more about. Um, most of the questions that we heard here tonight were uh, not about uh, public schools, but racial issues uh, in the city. Um, we need more diversity of thought. Uh, in our in, in the whole election process to be honest with you um, so you know I, uh, I'd like like to let the public know take take the time to go on YouTube and go on my YouTube channel and uh, you can hear me speaking fully without time constraints uh, in that Avenue anytime you would like it's Mike Dillon jr. for L uh, Mike Dillon jr. for LSC uh, on YouTube you can find all of my all my opinions there uh, without any of the constraints of this setup. Thank you. All right, that concludes our question period. And th I want to thank all of you so much, incumbents and candidates alike, for your dedication to this community and both in the pandemic and uh, campaigning during a pandemic. Um, thank you all for your time for being here and f everyone for listening. Um, thank you to the questioners. George Prokop and Vladimir Saldana, and um, to the LTC team, to co-sponsors, and I'll just add from Lowell Votes, uh, to remember to check your registration status if you need to do that. You can do that online and register online. Early voting starts October 20th till the 29th, and we can have mail-in voting as an option this year as well, and of course on November 2nd. If you need to look up your district, you can go to uh, your Lowell, your vote dot org. Um, I'm sorry, I want to make sure. Yep, your Lowell, your vote, and uh, look up lowellma.gov slash find my district. So thank you all again so much, and um, we'll see you at the next one. Good night. <laughs>